Good morning. Welcome to another Artifact Adventures of Wake Up with Ashland this Thursday morning. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. My name is Eric Brooks. I am the curator here at Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate. Uh, like I say, it's great to be with you. It's a beautiful day. Hope you're enjoying the warming weather. Uh, we want, before we get into our artifact for the day, to thank uh, the pre-mutual funds for their support of this program. We very much appreciate their support and thanks to their support we're able to bring you uh, Artifact Adventures and our Wake Up with Ashland series. So we very much appreciate that opportunity. Also, if you've been enjoying Ashland in any way, whether it's watching our uh, Wake Up with Ashland programs or reading the blog or engaging in any other way via the website or coming out and walking on the grounds and so on, um, please take a moment and visit our website, click the donate button, make a donation in support of the estate. Uh, all of the things that we do cost money and right now um, our primary source of revenue is those donations. So we very much appreciate any and all donations that can be made and they will enable us to continue to bring you this sort of programming. So please take a moment and if you have the opportunity uh, to do that. So today, our Artifact Adventure focuses on uh, one of the members of the family that we regularly interpret, someone uh, who is very important to our story. Uh, when Ashland was established as a museum, it was established to preserve the legacy of Henry Clay, but also to preserve the legacy of his great-granddaughter, Madeline McDowell Breckenridge. Uh, we're coming to you today with that because today... Uh, yesterday was her 142nd birthday, so we want to celebrate her birthday. Oops, sorry. And uh, we want to recognize Madge. Uh, this year marks the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, giving women the right to vote. Uh, we had prepared a lot of programming related to that. Obviously, some of that has had to go by the boards. We hope we'll be able to do some more later this year. Uh, but this is a good opportunity to stop and, and remember the, that particular centennial and to talk about Madge and her role in women's suffrage. Uh, see, we've got a number of viewers already this morning, a couple of our volunteers. Um, one of my colleagues is on, and she'll be helping to uh, bring questions. If you have questions, um, add links and so on. So I appreciate that. My wife is watching, which probably means my cat is watching. She apparently really enjoys the show. Didn't know my cat was so into museums until I started doing this, but yes, correct. Her 148th birthday was yesterday, um, and we will celebrate the centennial of her passing later this year. So um, we're celebrating Madge and talking about the things that she did. So let's go on now and look at the artifact of Madge's. This is uh, one of... Uh, one of the more important artifacts uh, that Madge owned and something she used a great deal. And I see here that we've just been joined by one of the descendants. And yesterday, I used the genealogical software to figure out that she was Madge's second great-niece. Her great-great-grandfather was Madge's brother, Thomas Clay McDowell. So good morning, Julie. Thanks for coming to watch. Uh, and yes, my cat does wish she could be like Gypsy the Ashland cat. I'm sure my cat would love to come here. I'm not sure Ashland would love for my cat to come here, but uh, someday maybe I'll do a thing on Gypsy. That's a neat story, uh, and we have sort of an artifact that we could do that. So uh, an interesting idea there. So let's take a look at our artifact. I'll pull back a little here, at least try to. And we've got this is a drop front desk. On this particular desk is what's called a drop front or slant top. In this particular form, uh, you can find even in Henry Clay's time. In fact, we have one in the study that is of Henry Clay's era, although I don't believe it has any particular connection to Henry Clay. And these are fairly standard in their uh, size and shape. You can see it's got a drop front. Then you can see that at the top there are a series of compartments and drawers and then three large drawers at the bottom. You can store your papers or books or other documents or things in the drawers and you know, letters and supplies and things at the top. I'm going to come in here. You can see we've got a lot of little small drawers, um, cubby holes where you can store things. Um, so lots of neat stuff. 
If anybody out there is a Stephen Colbert fan, and I've become a Colbert fan, he's been doing his show at home, and he sits in a corner next to a desk very much like this and keeps his little notes for the show in the, the cubby hole. So uh, some people still use these. Uh, I'm going to open this door here. I have cleaned my hands, so they're good and clean for this. Um, you can see there an inside compartment. You can see the uh, our broken arch pediment there. Um, and another little drawer. Again, you keep postage stamps or paper clips or whatever you need for your desk. I also want to show you something else that's pretty cool. Uh, and this is not uncommon with this type of furniture. Um, it's found fairly regularly in a way to use space that might otherwise be lost. Let's see if I can get this out. Here we go. We have here a storage compartment. You might put letters or documents or I don't know, whatever supplies you might want, but it's an additional piece of storage that uses up what might otherwise be lost space. And to open that, you have to go in the center compartment and at the very back, there are two little notches. And you reach into those notches and you can push behind the drawer to push it out, which I did before we started so that it would be set to go. Um, so that's kind of neat. Uh, a lot of people don't realize there are compartments in that location. Um, you can see, again, more drawers and other compartments over there. Uh, I'm gonna come down here and I'll show you the downstairs drawers. It's got these nice decorative stringers. Um, very attractive piece, very functional as well. Uh, the importance of this piece can be summed up in this photograph. You can see here's Madge sitting at her desk. This was her desk. Um, she had this desk made in 1896. Um, we know that because we have a couple of letters her father wrote to her. She had gone to New York City uh, she traveled a great deal uh, and was in New York City at the time when the desk was finished and he reported this was March 30th and April the 5th or thereabouts of 1896 that the desk had been finished and that it was at Ashland and he sends her the bill uh, and a check to pay for the desk. So that's how we know exactly when this desk was made. Um, and she used it from that time until the end of her life and it would have been used here until uh, she moved when she married. She and her husband bought a house over on Linden Walk. For those of you who live in Lexington, if you go down Euclid towards UK from where it intersects with Tate's Creek, Linden Walk is almost down to UK. Unfortunately, that house doesn't stand any longer. It was torn down, and there's an apartment building there now, uh, which is kind of on the middle of Linden Walk. If you're heading from Euclid towards Maxwell, I believe it is. It's on the right side, kind of in the middle. So that's where her house was, and this would have gone there. And it probably came back here when she died. Her sister would have acquired it. Now, if you look carefully in the photograph, you can see the inkwell here and the blotter, and she's got a quill, uh, all that stuff. And you can see the chair she's sitting in. Well, I'm going to pull back over here. That's the chair in which Madge was sitting. It's the very one that's in the photograph. This is the blotter that she has her arm on. I have opened it as it is in the photo. And this is the inkwell that is in the photograph. Now this inkwell is really interesting. Not only was it Madge's, it was also her great grandfather's. It was Henry Clay's. So every time she dipped her pen into that inkwell and wrote something, she was writing from the same inkwell her great grandfather wrote from. And I think that's really cool. And I think that probably meant a great deal to Madge. Uh, she used his legacy and his example a great deal in the work that she did and as an inspiration for the things that she was doing. And it has several parts, a place to keep your pens. Uh, this is the ink reservoir. You open it up and fill it with ink and then dip your pen in. This is probably for water to clean your pen. And then the thing here, that's called a sand shaker. And that would be filled with sand. And once you wrote your document, you would shake the sand over it pick the document up, shake the sand off, and it would fix the ink so as to help it dry and keep it from smudging or whatever so that you could then put it in an envelope or do whatever you need to do with it. And those are fairly standard. Most inkwells uh, come with those accoutrements, uh, or at least did at that time, because they were necessary to the act and art of writing. And these are some silver pens. These are probably Madeline's era. I don't know that either of those are hers, but um, some silver pens that we have out. The white quill, well, <laughs> that's a repro. Um, we bought that from a company that sells supplies for reenactors, but it looks just like the one she's using. I mean, she's got a white quill. 
Now, I don't know. Quilts were like that were probably not that commonly used, and she may have just had it for decorative effect. I don't know. But she is holding one, so it's appropriate to have one on her blotter. Now, pull back. What did she do with this desk? How did she use this desk? Why is it important? Well, Madge was a prolific writer. She wrote for a wide range of publications, uh, wrote often over the course of her life in support of the causes that she actively promoted. Uh, she wrote great, well, very often for the local paper. Here's Madge. This is her husband. I'll try to get over here, maybe you can see it a little better. That's DeShay Breckenridge. Um, her husband was the editor of the Lexington Herald. Uh, that building is downtown. It's now commonly referred to as the Nun Building down on Martin Luther King and it's actually apartments. But uh, he edited the paper, so she had a ready outlet for her writings. Uh, probably would have had that anyway, but it certainly didn't hurt to have be married to the editor. Uh, so she wrote prolifically uh, and wrote very, very well. She was a very skilled writer. Uh, with a great wit, and use that wit like a sword to cut her opponents. Uh, for example, she wrote a letter uh, in about 1918 to the governor of Kentucky. Um, at that time, the United States was in the world, into World War I. Many of the men in the state had gone off to war, so the women were being asked to step up and work in factories and things like that, basically take the places of men at home. And she wrote to the governor saying, you're asking us to do all this work, but you're not permitting us to have a voice in what's going on and, and how the war is being prosecuted because we can't vote. So uh, she says, Kentucky women are not idiots, although closely related to Kentucky men. It's one of my favorite quotes referring to the fact that they're not going to stand by and do these things without some say so. I see someone asks about the ring on DeShay's finger. Is that a mood ring? Well, I don't know. Uh, I guess. It's probably a signet ring. Signet rings were pretty common, and I could see him wearing one. He is a member of one of Kentucky's other major important families. Uh, John C. Breckenridge, a relative of his, was vice president of the United States. Um, and many of his relatives were uh, important people. In fact, one of his relatives, Joseph Deshay, was governor of the state of Kentucky. So it's probably some sort of family signet uh, ring. Another quote of Madeline's that she made uh, in talking about women in Kentucky is that women in Kentucky were classed poetically with bourbon and racehorses and politically with imbeciles and criminals. So again, you don't have to wonder much about what, what she is thinking. Um, if you're interested in those quotes, we do sell some things in the museum store uh, that have the quotes on them. You can go to our museum store page on our website and look that up or contact Phil, our museum store manager, and he can help you with those sorts of things. So that's Madge. Now, what, why was Madge writing so much? What were her causes? What was the work that she was doing? Well, she was a champion uh, progressive reformer. She lived in a time period where the roles for women were drastically changing, where women had a lot more involvement in public affairs, uh, in running the country, uh, in taking active part in life of their community and so on. And she did that very, very well. Um, she, her sister-in-law, DeShay's sister, was a, a very highly educated woman who had a law degree um, and a PhD and worked in Chicago with Jane Addams of Hull House. And so she got uh, very interested in uh, reform to some degree with that, already had been interested in actually uh, Sophie Nisbet encouraged her a great deal. So she became a great champion of many causes. She championed the poor. Uh, for example, come down here. Here's a photograph. That's the Lincoln School. That building stood at the intersection of Newtown Pike and Main Street on the south side of Main Street, outside Newtown Pike. It's not there now. Uh, that area was called Irish Town, and it was an impoverished area of town um, underserved so she built this school to serve the community there and it was not only a k-12 school but a community center women uh, for example in the evenings went there to do laundry because many of them did not have laundry facilities at home uh, so this was a way she could serve that community uh, she raised the funds for it it's named it after abraham lincoln because his son robert gave money to the school to the school uh, and it operated until 1967 when it closed. 
Um, I should note that Lexington now has a school called Madeline Now Breckenridge Elementary, uh, named in her honor, that opened a little before the Lincoln School closed and was named because they could see the Lincoln School would eventually close and they wanted to make sure she was remembered. So a uh, very important contribution. She also championed African Americans. She was not necessarily a voice for full equality, but certainly recognized the struggles they were having in the Jim Crow era and championed them. And when she died, they actually wrote a testimonial in the paper, African Americans in Lexington, thanking her, her for their support. She championed sufferers of tuberculosis. She herself was a sufferer of tuberculosis. Uh, and helped a great deal in creating the uh, sanitarium here in Lexington, which was out Georgetown Road near New Circle Road. And most of it is gone now as well. Um, some of it stood until, well, within the last 20 years anyway, but it's since been turned down, torn down. So anyway, that was another of her causes. But the cause she championed most assiduously was the right to vote for women. Uh, Mad Madeline McDowell Breckenridge was a suffragist who adamantly uh, supported the right to vote for women and fought for that right. This may or may not have been her dress, we don't know, but it's of the sort that she often wore. The sash is a reproduction, I will note. We have this little button here. That's, let's see if I can get this steady enough that you can see it good. There it is. Uh, it says votes for women. That's an actual button. She may have worn it, her sister may have worn it. But those were worn often by suffragists to support the right to vote for women. She fought for that right her whole life, uh, championed that cause at every level, local, national, and even internationally. She traveled widely, was involved in a number of organizations that fought for that right, including the Kentucky Equal Rights Association and the National American Women's Suffrage Association, otherwise known as NASA, N-A-W-S-A, -A, of which she was the vice president, one of the major organizations fighting for that right on a national level. Uh, and ultimately, she was successful in seeing that right granted. This is a picture from the Kentucky Historical Society collection showing Governor Morrow ratifying uh, the 19th Amendment in January of uh, 1920. Uh, that right would ultimately be ratified nationally in August of 1920, and Madeline was able to cast a vote in the presidential election that year. She cast a vote for the Democratic candidate because that candidate supported the League of Nations which was a precursor of the United Nations, and she thought that was an incredibly important thing to have. So she supported that candidate. Uh, unfortunately, that would be the only vote she ever got to cast. And the reason for that is that Madeline suffered a great deal. Move my hand out of the way here. Uh, and the most interesting thing in many ways about Madge is what she overcame to do the things she did. This is a leather boot in our collection. Uh, this particular boot she wore because she suffered from tuberculosis of the bone, uh, which ultimately cost her her foot. That happened by the time she was 24. A few years later, uh, she suffered a stroke, costing her the use of one hand. These things did not slow her down. Uh, quite the contrary. Every time something like that happened, she worked harder and faster to get things done because she was deeply concerned she would not live a long life and did not want to leave things unfinished. That proved prophetic. In 1920, uh, on Thanksgiving Day, or shortly before Thanksgiving Day, she suffered a stroke and died on Thanksgiving Day of that year at the age of 48. I'm now 49, so I appreciate a great deal the length of her life, um, the fact that it was not long. But she accomplished tremendous things in the years that she lived. So uh, I think that's a remarkable and important thing. Uh, I'll be glad to take any questions if anybody has any questions. Um, Come back up here, look at the, look at the uh, desk a little more, Henry Clay's Inkwell. Uh, we do have a women's tour. Uh, hopefully at some point in the near future, uh, we'll find a way to do something with that. Um, we're working on those things. Um, we also have an exhibit on Madge, and I will look to try to find ways to make that available uh, at some point in the future. Um, it had just opened when we closed, so... Uh, Hopefully at some point. There are a lot of interesting artifacts in that exhibit, many of which have never been seen before. So we'll see if we can make that happen in some form or fashion. Well, before we go, 